Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. I am going to get started. I want to be mindful of everyone's time and hopefully we'll have a few more people trickle in as we go on. So my name is Jessica Bloor. I'm inside sales manager here at Transmatic. For those of you unfamiliar with Transmatic, we are a deep draw stamping supplier with headquarters here in Holland, Michigan. With me on the phone today, I have Ron D'Alessandro. He's our director of advanced product development. Ron's been at Transmatic for about 30 years, and uh, he's really passionate about you know, the solutions that we can bring to our customers. Our goal today is to get organizations to start thinking differently about new product design and development, specifically as it relates to metal products. Ron's going to cover what this process looks like and how advancements in deep draw can provide the best overall value when we're comparing to other metal manufacturing processes. Please feel free to enter comments, questions in the chat. You should see a symbol for Q&A on the right side of your screen. I'll type in there in a minute just so it pops up. And we'll end a little bit early. We're planning for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we can end a little early for Q&A. With that, I'm going to kick it off to Ron. Thanks, Jessica. OK, so before we get into you know, the deep draw process and some of the advantages and that uh, that can be performed with, the, with with our process. We want to talk a little more about the product development process, which is a extremely critical um, area of concentration for companies to continually work on next generation products. I mean, that's how companies compete. That's how companies create value and that's how they gain more market share. And so um, this is an, an extremely important part of any company's success. So in terms of the, the actual phases of the product development cycle, uh, in a very simple step-by-step uh, -step process here, we have like you know, five phases, but I would think that concept research and analysis are more market-based focused, whereas development and launch are, are more in the manufacturing and development slash validation process. Um, so mechanical innovation, I just wanted to speak a little bit about innovation. A lot of companies talk about new innovative next generation platform products. Um, a lot of companies kind of overuse the word innovation. I think if you go back to the industrial revolution, there were a lot of new revolutionary products that came into the market. Uh, but I think that from year to year, companies are just trying to compete. They're trying to find more market share, trying to uh, find ways to uh, increase the interest and uh, sell more, more, more products. So really what it is, it's kind of a step-by-step -step slow evolution of an older product line with improvements. So with that, we're going to focus on, you know, how do we help in that respect? So usually as companies go to the marketplace they they start with a, a few critical areas of focus what are some of the new product features or what are some of the new technologies that i can employ so that i can increase market share or how do i lower the cost of my current part or my current product how do i improve the product performance or the product quality so these are any one of the three or sometimes all three of these areas are, are the reasons why companies go through the product development process. So now we get into a little more detail about that product uh, development cycle. And I'm not going to go through all the detail on this sheet. Uh, I did a little bit of research and, and found some common themes from companies that are doing the product development. And it's really three key phases in, in terms of strategy development and then uh, manufacturing. And strategy, again, that's a lot of uh, marketing information. That marketing information and budgeting uh, is fed into the development team to come up with a product based on certain criteria or areas of focus where they feel that they can have a competitive edge. Uh, those product features and uh, could be you know, fairly complex and the overall process in developing that product can be complex uh, as you can see here with all the different phase gates uh, but as you go through this entire process from especially through the development and, and the manufacturing process nowhere do you see uh, in here 
anywhere that where the company is engaging with suppliers and engaging specifically with process specific uh, suppliers that have you know some advanced technology and i think this is this is an area where a focus where i think that companies like transmatic that have a lot of advanced technology in metals uh, can pro that could help companies success so as an engineer is going through, or engineers, an engineering team for that matter, is going through the product development process. They're designing a product. They've got all the information and all the criteria from the marketing teams, and they're going through and developing this particular part or product. Uh, they already have predetermined what those manufacturing processes are. As they're designing this product, depending on the volume, depending on the features, the fit form, the function, the tolerances, strength of material, they already have in mind, OK, well, this is going to be, a, you know, a, a metal injection molded part because of the tolerances and the volume, or this is going to be a, a forged part, or it can be stamped or machined, cold headed. Uh, it could be any one of those or others or combination of those types of processes. So a lot of that information is being predetermined. And I think what we want to talk about is what can we do with deep draw that could replace some of the other considerations that companies were maybe considering machining or another more expensive process. So we get, we're going to get into the deep draw process now, and hopefully we will able we'll be able to explain some of the capabilities so that product engineers have a better idea of what we're capable of doing. So what is deep draw? Let's start with a simple definition of deep draw. Anytime a part's diameter exceeds or a part's depth of draw exceeds the, the half of the diameter is considered deep draw. In, in some cases, you know, may see like on Wikipedia, it'll say one times the diameter. But regardless, it's basically a depth of draw of a metal component. Uh, and it's not always round, but this particular part that we're looking at is a sequence of uh, steps of a process of a deep draw component. In this case, it's probably more like eight times the diameter. So next. Uh, slide. How does a deep draw process work? Is this like a progressive die? Is this, you know, what, what's the process look like? Um, this is a very simple video of a deep draw process. We start off with flat stock. And then we blank a diameter, uh, a disc, so to speak. It's not connected like on a progressive tool where the material is on a carry web. We don't have a carry web. We, we, we have a separate disk and that's transferred in the far right into the very first station, which is a cupping station. And then it goes through a series of draw reductions. And then you get into the final form and then a pierced bottom. And then we clip off the flange. This is a very simple tube type uh, part, uh, but this, this pretty much explains the deep draw process. Now we get into a little more of what are some of the advantages of deep draw? What can you do with deep draw? Um, there are, are, are many advantages with the deep draw process, and I'm not going to say this in the, in the same sequence that I have in bullet point form here, but basically a deep draw part is a near net shape component, and it runs very quickly anywhere from, we can go from 20 to 120 strokes per minute, and we can add features. Uh, to the part, various types of features, and we'll get into that here a little further uh, into the presentation. Uh, so the co the process is very, very efficient and it's cost effective. And another advantage is work hardening. Uh, sometimes parts have to have a certain level of hardness or strength. In many cases, we'll have to go out for secondary heat treating pro uh, process. Our part work hardens as the material is being formed over in, in, in the die. Uh, the grain is all being aligned and it's actually strengthening the part and you get work hardening. Uh, and that's kind of a process that occurs just through our process. So there's an advantage in that regard. The other thing is tool flexibility. Unlike on a progressive tool, that's all locked into one die set. Uh, our tools are very flexible. You can add stations, you can change and alter. You can make a family of different parts. Uh, because of the flexibility of the tooling. 
And then we have complex part configurations. And below you can see a wide variety of part uh, configurations, sizes, shapes, different types of materials. Uh, every part that you see down there is a part that comes complete off the press, running again from anywhere from 20 to 120 strokes per minute. So what's a deep draw at Transmatic? Transmatic's been around since 1968. Um, as uh, Jessica said, I've been here for 30 years. I've seen a lot of changes in 30 years at this company. And I can tell you that this company focuses on being the best in the industry. Uh, there are very few companies that have a global investment all around the world and that serve the world with this technology. We are uh, extremely uh, capable, uh, even beyond deep draw. We get into assemblies, laser welding, non-destructive testing. Uh, we have uh, anywhere between five and 600 ton presses. You can see on the right uh, our plant, what, it, what one of our plants looks like. Uh, that, uh, the reason why that picture is there is, if I were to tell you that that was China or that was Mexico or that was the US, you wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, all of our plants look the same. Technology is, is consistent. Our systems are consistent. Our people are cross-trained. And, and um, the operations that we have globally, in, we have our headquarters in Holland, Michigan. We have a plant wholly owned operation in Monterey, Mexico, and we have a wholly owned facility in Suzhou, China. Uh, those facilities, again, are self-sufficient and they operate very, very effectively. Um, and again, it's very similar to what you would see in the United States. In terms of deep draw applications, we, we kind of split our market between automotive and non-automotive. We're about 50-50. Uh, but some of the areas uh, in, in market sectors that we serve in automotive, um, you can see here a wide variety of, part of, of product, anywhere from parts that look like they're flat stamped to actually assembled products. Um, we seem to get involved with products that are, that are in higher volume, uh, ABS braking systems, fuel rail components, injectors, oxygen sensor solenoids, spark plug, uh, capacitors. Uh, just to name a few, you can see all the different product features that were in some of those parts and configurations. In our non-automotive, this is a snapshot of the non-automotive uh, markets that we serve. Uh, we have about 140 customers and there are a lot more markets that we serve. These are just a few uh, that we've highlighted that uh, we feel are uh, maybe our higher volume or higher uh, end uh, customer base. Uh, but again, you can see here the types of parts that we do. You know, we anything from you know brass to copper to aluminum, round and square, um, very a variety of of of, of processes in, in different markets that are very capable and that that Transmatic is uh, our our process is conducive to to serve. So the VAVE, Value Analysis, Value Engineering process, uh, Transmatic's been doing value engineering for a long time. Since around 98, 99, um, we started this process as a means to help our customers uh, get an early involvement on the product development. And, and basically what we'll do is we'll go in and we'll work side by side with our customers to ensure that they're developing a, pro a product as cost efficiently as they can uh, in order that that product can scale up in, in high volume production. Um, and then also to look at the, the des desired performance criteria and engineering criteria. So once we come up with a, a, a design or to help our customers in terms of the development process, we'll go through a forming simulation process where we design a actual tooling lineup in our uh, simulation. In this particular case, what we're looking at is a lithium ion uh, battery cell case. It's made out of uh, 3003 aluminum. And we went through about 187 design iterations on our simulation to get this right. The criteria for this part that may look fairly simple 
was extremely complicated. Uh, very, very tight tolerances, tight form radiuses, uh, material thickness variation of very little variation. So we go through a wall ironing process to control all the product features. Uh, again, that was all simulated. And then when we built the tool, we had a high degree of accuracy because the forming simulation completely replicated our uh, production tooling process. Case studies. I wanted to talk a little bit about some, some case studies. And we talked earlier about screw machine uh, components. We love to look at screw machine parts and convert them into deep drawn stampings because machine components are expensive. The capital is expensive to support machining processes. The time it takes to machine a part is long and the expense and the scrap for the material, there's a lot of wasted material. So we love to go in and show customers that we can take a machine part and turn it into a stamping. That's exactly what we did in this particular case for this valving component using a shock absorber. That was a brass machine component with a series of holes in it that regulated the actual oil flow for damping and came up with a metal formed uh, deep drawn component shown in the bottom there on the right. The next case study is another screw machine part that was a, a difficult um, component because it had varying degrees of, of, of wall thickness. I mean, the flange thickness was 30 thousandths. The wall thickness was, uh, what was it? It was uh, close to 200 thousandths. So it wasn't directly applicable to the deep draw process. So what we came up with in this particular part, in order to control the OD, in order to get the thread pitch diameters that were needed, and in order to get the ID configured so that we can get a bearing surface for our customers end use, we came up with an emboss uh, operation that formed two embosses, and that actually acted as a, a bushing or a support area for a mating component. And that's how we got the thickness where we needed it. And then we actually uh, went through, after the part was formed, we did a, a two out thread forming operation. So we eliminated the need for thread cutting. So we actually formed the thread. And again, this part runs extremely quick and we actually saved our customer a significant amount of money on this, on this new product. <clears throat> this particular example is just a simple uh, example of a, of a two-piece assembly that we turned in and made it into one piece. And we've done three pieces and made them into one piece that our customer uh, wasn't aware of that, that was capable of. But once we understand the product function, what a customer is trying to do, we could usually come up with a way to save, save some time and money. Uh, in this particular case, we had a die cast part and a metal plastic injection molded part that was, um, it had like a split seam. And then the worst part of this particular, of their design was that it was labor intensive to get it assembled and they couldn't run them in scale. Um, but running the, the component that we came up with, which, which is that one piece uh, stamping you see on the bottom there, uh, that was run probably 70 strokes a minute. And again, that was a nice cost reduction and quality improvement for our customer. This was a commercial hardware uh, product that Transmatic spent a significant amount of time in development. We kind of did this on our own. The part you see there on the on the, the where it says old part was probably about 11 piece assembly, very complicated, um, and it had uh, screw machine parts. It had a drawn over mandrel. Uh, centerless ground part. It had die casting. Uh, it, it had some metal, some flat metal stamp parts. They were having issues in the field. They're having field failure, cycle testing. And part of the problem they, they had after we analyzed and took the parts apart and did our own analysis, we found out that the zinc die cast material was breaking down because it was rubbing up against um, steel, cold rolled steel components. So we, we kind of kept that in mind and came up with the design on the right. It's about eight parts instead of 11. So this was a, a million and a half dollar cost reduction that we came up with. It took us over a year to design and develop the product, but this was something that we're proud of because it was our design, our development. We did some initial base testing and this product actually went three million cycles before failure 
whereas the old product was running between 50 and 80,000 cycles before failure. So it was not only a cost reduction, it was a performance improvement. And the key thing about this particular part was it allowed our customer to increase their market share because of the improved performance. And this is where I, I really want to focus with uh, uh, customers and, and, and manufacturers and OEMs. Give us a chance to take a look at your product and get us involved early on. And I can guarantee you we can probably find a better way or an improved method to take cost out and improve product performance. But the more that we understand about the end product and what it is you're trying to do, the more that we can help. So with that, I would like to uh, encourage any questions. Thank you, Ron. So yeah, if everyone would like to use, there should be a live event Q&A chat for you to type your questions into. Um, I do have one for you, Ron. So you talk okay. a lot about the different things you can do from machining to deep draw. So what about when parts have multi thicknesses through the wall of the part? Is that something that you can accommodate? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, most people, when they think of the deep draw process, they think of consistent wall thicknesses all the way around, top, bottom, sides. Uh, in most cases, and in a lot of cases, the deep draw process, that's how parts are made. Um, but what we've learned over the years, and this is one of the advancements in technologies that we've developed, we can do multiple thickness. Uh, we can do wall ironing, in some cases, between 50 and 80 percent, depending on the type of material. Uh, I would say cold rolled steel, uh, brass, copper, some of those types of alloys, we could actually redistribute metal and put material and make it thicker in certain areas and then th thinner in others. Um, that is a, a that, that was a great question because I think that is one of the recent advancements that we've made, allowing us to compete more with companies that do cold forming, for instance, uh, or even die casting for that matter, uh, or forging. Um, and 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 even machine components that have multiple thickness requirements. So appreciate that question. Yeah, great. And uh, I saw a slide earlier, Ron, about the types of materials that you manufacture. Can you talk a little bit more to that? Yeah, uh, low carbon steel and stainless steels um, represent the highest volume of products that we make, uh, but they're certainly not the only ones. Uh, you know, we get into a lot of the exotic materials. Uh, Inconel, uh, Hanes 230, some of those high strength materials. Uh, we even do some work with titanium. Uh, we've done, we actually, we won an award for deep drawing a, a titanium part, which uh, the titanium industry recognized us and, and did a nice write up about our, about our capability. And I, I don't want to get into all the specific detail how we did that or what we did, but a lot of that had to do with the, the coolants and lubrication that we use during the metal forming process in order to achieve uh, deep draw metal capability with, with titanium. Well, we do a wide variety of materials. I think I, on one of those slides, there was a quick snapshot of maybe four or five materials, but uh, it goes way beyond that. If it's made out of metal, we'll take a shot at it and we'll, we'll you know, we'll do, we'll do our best to figure out a way to make the part. Great, thanks, Ron. So you showed some very complicated components on some of the slides. So what types of things do you do outside of the press if it's not part complete? You know, are there other secondary operations or things like that? Yeah, it's another good question. We didn't get into a lot of that. Uh, we, we talked a lot about the deep draw process, which is what we do, but we extend the value of any product as far as our customer wants us to take it. Uh, we made a lot of capital investments in automated assembly, for instance. We do uh, non-destructive automatic inspection uh, uh, for uh, non-destructive testing for products that have a, a high uh, you know, safety protocol. Um, we do uh, laser welding. We can do helium leak testing. Uh, various types of secondary operations that, that, that weren't mentioned. But again, it, it's, you know, we're a value seeking company and we want to provide as much uh, value uh, to our customers that 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 need it. And if they ask us to do an assembly, a laser welded operation, for instance, on a component, um, we'll do it. You know, we'll figure out a way to do it. We have a, um, an automation team uh, for our automated assembly that focus on that part of, part of our business. Uh, so 
and, and again, it's just it's just kind of an extension of our value proposition. Great. One last question for you, Ron. How large of parts can you manufacture? Well, we can go we can go up to you know from a, a, a microscopic size component, maybe like you know thirty second of an inch in diameter, uh, you know thirty second tall, very small in a, in a very precision tightly tolerance component all the way up to 600 ton part which can make up to about a 10 inch tall uh, maybe 8 to 10 inch diameter uh, in various material thicknesses again it depends on what the product need is but i would say that you know the biggest part we do is would probably be you know 10 by 10. all right great well it doesn't look like there's any additional questions so to everyone that participated thank you so much for your time you will be receiving a recording of the webinar. Please feel free to share with your colleagues. Um, if you do have questions on components that you're starting to work on, please don't hesitate to reach out to Ron or myself. No matter how out of the box it is, I promise Ron gets very excited. Uh, so again, thank you to all, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Great. Thanks, everyone.